Are we ready to start? Okay, we are online. Hi everybody, my name is Ben, and I'm gonna talk to you today about GANs. Uh, Biksha asked me to come here because I'm kind of passionate about these things. Um, but just to start off, has anyone heard of GANs before by a show of hands? Okay. Has anyone actually trained them before? Come on in, join us. <laughs> All right, a couple of you. Um, they're quite a challenge, they're quite interesting, they've been hot since about 2014. And we're going to tell you all about what they do. But uh, to start off with, this was just a couple, uh, a video of some training and kind of what it, what GANs are able to do. Um, so we're going to give a shortened version of the lecture from last semester, which was broken into two parts. So we're going to do it in terms of basically pros and cons. So we're going to talk first about GANs, why they're cool, what they do, all the cool stuff you can do with them, and we're going to try to do that in about the first half. And then the second half, we're going to talk about, OK, so they're so good, why doesn't everyone use them? What's the problem? And the problem is that they're kind of hard to train. There are a lot of tricks. There's still a lot of ongoing research into what we can actually do with these, with these generative adversarial networks. Um, so the first thing to understand is, did you guys do a VAE lecture last week or maybe the week before? No. You guys have not talked about VAEs before? Okay. They talk about okay, recitation mentioned VAEs, but you guys didn't actually talk about what they are. Okay, so that's important to start. So both VAEs and generative adversarial networks are types of generative networks. What that means is uh, you want to compare them to discriminative networks, which is what you're used to. You're used to, here's an image, tell me what the, uh, what the digit is in it. Is it one, two, three, four, whatever. So, I use that already. Um, I have to click this in. Um, so discriminative networks are basically written as p of y given z, or give, given x. Someone gives you an x like an image and you try to tell it what the image is. When you talk about generative networks, oh, nice, that works, right out of the box. When you talk about generative networks, you're talking about trying to model what the probability of x is, or what's the joint distribution of x and y, or how do I produce x given the y. So these types of distributions are um, much more flexible but much more complicated, but they're basically distributions that allow you to produce images and reason about what images as opposed to what labels. It's a, it's a related problem, and the question is why would you do that? So you can still make judgments about the probability of y given x or the probability of x given y if you model the joint distribution correctly. Uh, the joint distribution basically gives you all of the information you need, the probability of x and y combined. It's got a lot of information in there, and from there you can figure out what's the marginal of x, what's the marginal of y, what's the probability of x given y, all of these different combinations. But, as you can tell, that also means it's more complicated. So this model of p of x and y is much harder to learn than just the model of p of y given x. If you think about it, you, um, your y's are typically something like uh, a multinomial or some very simple distribution. It's a softmax over you know, zero through nine, but it's something very simple versus if you're trying to model a distribution of x, which is images, you've got something very large and complicated. Uh, similarly, your mapping in the discriminative case tends to be many to one. It tends to be deterministic. It's here's an image, what is this of? And you say one, and one is the right answer, you're done. Versus if I go the other way and I say, so for ones, what do the images look like? You've now got a complicated distribution over images, which is much harder to model. The, the dimensionality of y is typically much less than the dimensionality of, of uh, x, I should say. Um, so they're complicated, they're harder, but they do have certain advantages. Uh, one interesting viewpoint comes from Ing and Jordan in 2001, so it actually predates GANs but it relates more to what generative models are as composed to discriminative models. So the traditional viewpoint from Vapnik, um, I wish I had this quote in here, is that you should never solve a more general problem when you can solve as an intermediate step than the problem you're actually trying to solve. So from the Vapnik perspective, it's if you're trying to get the probability of y given x, if your goal is to label images, then why would you try to learn this complicated joint distribution? What's the point? And the research from Ing and Jordan actually says that there are kind of two different uh, ranges of performance and that generative models 
actually tend to have better biases, learn better with the, uh, they actually can learn with logarithmic number of training examples as opposed to linear. So while if you have an infinite amount of data and your goal is to learn how to label images, you probably just go with your discriminative model. Maybe if you don't have infinite data, then these generative models are learning something else. They're learning much more, but what does that actually do for us? Um, so as we said, uh, just a VAE recap, because we want to be able to compare the two of these. You haven't covered it quite, or you may have covered some of it, but VAEs also try to address this, um, this issue of creating a generative model. And they do it by creating an autoencoder, and you guys know how autoencoders work. But the trick is that this thing that you're autoencoding into, this, this hidden representation, you're saying this has to be a Gaussian. And when you say this has to be a Gaussian, that means that's also something you can sample from. So what your goal is, is to learn this z that you can convert x into z and z back into x to reconstruct x well, but at the same time, you're gonna make z in some known region. So you can sample from that, you can generate x's, you can, because you can pull from z. Um, so that's, that's VAEs, and um, we could definitely talk in more detail about that if you guys wanna ask, but we do have some limited time today. Um, but the comparison between VAEs is when people run VAEs, they found, um, roughly speaking, things are blurry. But what VAEs are is they are optimizing a bound and they're not optimizing the actual thing you're trying to optimize. So they're analytically very nice, they're very easy to train, they guaranteed converge pretty much every time, but the actual place where they get to is kind of messy. Versus with GANs, we're gonna see the other side, which is GANs are harder to train, but when they do work correctly, the place they get is not blurry. It's actually very sharp and very good looking. Um, so they came out in 2014, uh, relatively new, although four years is, is a lot of time these days. Um, feels, that feels like a, a year, well, sorry, just going back to before Trump was elected. Um, <laughs> 2014, wow. Um, but anyways, so GANs are a way to build generative models. They're a little more flexible. They have more potential than VAEs. They have sharper results. They have cleaner results, much more intriguing. But the problem is just training them and actually getting them to work. So what are the GANs? How do they actually work? You have a generator. The generator is the thing that generates your, that generates your samples. It takes some random samples from a Gaussian, from whatever it is, but your prior, something that you can sample from, you know, uniform distribution, whatever it is, but it converts from this known distribution to images, to speech, to text. So whatever your target is, whatever you're trying to model, you say, I'm gonna create a function that goes from something I know, like a Gaussian, to this thing that I'm trying to model, which I don't know analytically, but I create a function that maps between the two of them. So you're learning this function that maps between the two of them, and how do you know what to produce? The discriminator is what tells you what to do. So your generator is producing the images, and your discriminator is gonna tell it what to produce. And the way the discriminator does this is that it tries to tell the difference between your real images, meaning images that are from your training data, and the images that your generator has produced from noise. So your generator is producing these images and your discriminator is saying, you're wrong, you should make that more over here and then the generator is adapting accordingly. So the generator never really sees the real data. The discriminator tells the difference between the real and the fake and that information is passed back to the generator, which does sound complicated. But <laughs> and I guess who's confused at that point or, or has any questions? Um, so the reason that's done is so that you can actually model the distribution. You don't have a specific target. You don't know what noise you want to map to what image. You know you want this noise distribution to map to this image distribution. So the traditional GAN, the discriminator uses cross-entropy loss. It tries to label these are fake, these are real, and the generator tries to confuse it so that it doesn't know which ones are real and fake. And if you think about it kind of intuitively, if the discriminator can't tell the difference between the real things and the, and the fake things, then that means your real stuff looks like your fake stuff, which means your generator's doing what it's supposed to do. 
because the end goal is to have your generator producing stuff that is indistinguishable from your real data. Um, so the loss function traditionally is cross entropy loss. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen that before, hopefully. But you're looking for drawing stuff from your latent prior distribution, running your discriminator on your generator of that latent distribution. So it's what does your discriminator say on the generated outputs versus what does your discriminator say on the real outputs. And you're trying to maximize the labels of these two. So you've got two players. The two players are fighting against each other. And they end up in this min-max game. And you're trying to find uh, the min-max with these two different players in the network. And that's kind of what leads to the complexity. That everything you've been dealing with before has been a single player optimizing a single objective function. And now it's two different people with two different competing objectives trying to fight it out with each other. And that's why we call it adversarial networks. So now that we've gone through kind of the more detailed, this is what it actually looks like, pictorially speaking. You've got your generator, which takes noise and makes images. And you've got your training data. And your discriminator tries to tell which one's which. And then your generator tries to confuse it as much as possible. Um, the fun picture, this is the, the math picture, which I'll go through right now. And the more fun one is this one, which is the generator is like this blindfolded forger. He doesn't know what he's painting. He doesn't know what he's supposed to paint. But he can paint things, and then the detective can tell him whether he's right or wrong. And then based off of this right or wrong information, he can try to make better images. So that is the, the high level view of how our GANs work. We have these simultaneous updates with these two moving targets. Because you can't just train the discriminator, then train the generator, or train one, then the other. You have to alternate. You have to do some simultaneous interleaving. But the, the min-max can only be achieved by both people working at the same time. Um, so there are many experiments. There's a lot of research on this. And that's what we're going through in kind of the second part is how do you balance these two guys? How do you get them to work and not have one guy beating up the other guy entirely? Or have all these other um, issues that we call it. Like, so so we'll, get, we'll get to the failures of GANs. Um, but the important thing to say is there is a stationary point, which means if the generator is producing stuff that looks exactly like the real images, then there's nothing the discriminator can do. So that would mean if there's nothing the discriminator can do, there's zero gradient with respect to the generator. And if the generator can't do any better, there's zero gradient the other way. So there is a stable point. But the question is, does it converge to that stable point, which is frequently no. So analytically, uh, we can provably say there is a point that is stable, which will do what you want it to do. But we can't show that it will actually get there. And recent research has been towards how do we modify this algorithm to try to actually get to that stable point and not just wander around it for a very long time, um, which does tend to happen. And um, so what, what this looks like conceptually, this is a little bit of a uh, a pictorial representation of a 1D GAN, but just trying to give you guys a, a good sense of it. Of If you see this kind of blue line being the discriminator function, you've got the generated and the real points. And it kind of describes right here. But your discriminator is trying to like push it one way or the other. The discriminator tells your data which way to go. Then your data moves there. Your discriminator updates. And when you're done, the generated and the real data matches entirely. And then the discriminator is just going to be a straight flat line. But in practice, um, if there are any great videos I would want to watch here while we have time. But um, I do have a lot of videos of what the GANs look like in practice. Sometimes they work really well. Sometimes they just oscillate. Um, but the types of outputs you get when they actually work well, um, this is from the 2014 paper. Things have gotten, obviously, much sharper and larger. If you were here early to the class, you saw I put up a video of these 1,000 by 1,000 face images that are absolutely gorgeous. But this is the, the 2014 results of you put some dogs and cats in, or you put some numbers in. This is, I think, CIFAR 10 or 100. I don't know which one. And faces 10, something like that. But um, you put data sets in. You just give it the x's. And then it tries to produce images that actually look like the data set you gave it. 
but it's not just producing those images. If that's all it was doing, you'd say, I've already got those images. Why don't I just take the data set and I'm done? The point is it can produce that data set. It can learn a manifold of that data set. It can learn how to transition from one, one face to another face. And it can learn to generate faces that it's never seen before. Um, so one example of the things it can do is you can interpolate along this hidden space. So I've got a mapping from random noise to images. If I take that random noise and I just interpolate between the random noise, over here I'll be interpolating between images. And the image interpolation tends to look like meaningful. At any point along the interpolation, it kind of creates a valid number. And then you can see the transition from 7 to 9 to 1, which actually does kind of make it. It's, it seems about right that the, the 7 and then the line completes and the line removes, whatever. But it, it gives you a way to have this very simple manifold or just a couple dimensions that you're working on while moving in this highly complicated image space. Yes? Yeah, yeah. So you're taking the, you're taking this random noise, you're taking this random noise, and then a bunch of points in between, running all of them through the function, and then seeing where all those points end up. So you've got a straight line here, and then in this function space, you've got some really complicated manifoldy thing. But all we're doing is we're we're taking these z samples, and we're taking a series of z's that goes in one direction or another direction. And later in the presentation, we'll actually see some very interesting variations of that where you can. Um, You'll see the InfoGAN later. You can try to disentangle with GANs. So what you do is you'll learn, learn a neural network, and then you'll have a vector over here, and that vector controls the bold. Then you'll have a vector over here, and that vector controls the italics. And you'll actually have very, very interpretable, like this vector is the digit, this one is bold, this one is size, and this one is rotation. And then you can just toy with each of those and produce images that do all of those things. So you suddenly understood what the the meaningful parts of these images are. Um, here, it's just kind of changing from number to number. But there's just the random space that it's learned. So it's still a manifold, but it's not interpretable yet. It's just kind of like going from 7 to 1, which I guess has some meaning, but not as much as we'll see later. Um, but just to compare it between VAs and GANs, VAs are guaranteed to work, but they are doing a lower bound, so they'll pretty much end up blurry with a guarantee versus GANs might not work at all, but when they work well, they work really well. Um, you only learn the decoder part traditionally. There are some extensions which learn the encoder, but you're just learning going from Z to X. And if you have a function that goes from Z to X, that doesn't mean you have a function that goes from X to Z. You can retroactively figure it out. Yes? Right, it's, it's a linear interpolation in the prior latent space. Yeah, but why is that linear? Like, like I, well, well, why is that like there's a better path which is not linear? That, you know, well, you could, you could interpolate in any direction you want. And actually, if you, did, did you see some of the uh, videos from the beginning of the class? Yeah, those, that's how those are made. Is I think that one is literally just a random walk through the data set from different points. Okay. And exactly how they choose their path, I mean, that depends on what you're trying to do. But, the, but really what we're trying to say is that any path you pick will go through only things that look like images. So you won't find some point in this space that looks like you know, an X. No, you're going, to get, you're going to get all digits because you trained it on digits. Everywhere in this manifold is a digit. It's just which way you walk over it. But that's kind of the, yeah. It's, it's been reduced down to only the parts which are actually populated in the space that are meaningful. And then whether you're, how exactly you want to walk through it, that depends on you. Um, like the, uh, the interpolation videos are like really cool, but less practical. Some people use them for things like, you may have seen these like adding, adding glasses. So you can like figure out what the vector for glasses are. And then if you take someone's image, you can add the glasses vector, and then it'll put glasses on their face. And linear, Seems like it shouldn't always work, but it is the simplest, and it does tend to work. And there are a lot of cases where it works where it really shouldn't. Like if you guys have seen like the word to vec examples that everyone loves, where you have like king minus queen equals man minus woman, 
And it's like, why are those linear? Because that's, that's really the easiest thing, and it tends to work out frequently. But um, yeah, so that, that, that's the story there. <coughs> um, anyways, so the, the real difference here of why the GANs are sharper than the VAEs is this last point to understand, which is when you're training your generator in your GAN, the thing that goes from latent to images, the inputs are samples from your prior directly. They are actually your prior. The, the pro, the, that is directly sampled from your prior. Versus the VAE, your, the things that you're putting into it are your encoded data. And your encoded data, you're saying, it should try to match your prior, but it's not going to be exactly your prior. So your GAN is trained to generate from exactly the prior versus the VAE is trained to generate from your encoded data, which is regularized to look like your prior. And that's, not, that's a, a very weird way of looking at the description between the two of them, but that does give you a grounds to compare. So that's why, it's one of the reasons why this GAN generator might ultimately produce better stuff than your VAE does, because your VAE will produce things that are in the intermediate space, that if you were to do these experiments of interpolating with the VAE, you would get a bunch of junk in between. You would get like, this looks like a one, this looks like a nine, and this looks like, I don't know what, it looks like a blurry mass. And that's kind of the results you'll get from VAEs. Um, yeah, and the other real difference is your VAE, at the end, it's an autoencoder. So you're saying, I want the L2 of these to match those, or I want the cross entropy of these to match those. Your GAN, what is your generator looking at? Your generator is getting data from your discriminator. Your discriminator is telling you what the difference is. It's not the L2, it's not the cross entropy, it's a function that a neural network is learning. So when you think about it in terms of what is the loss or what's the objective function, in the VAE, your loss is mean squared error. In your GAN, your loss is a function that the discriminator has learned. So it's much more flexible, and this is where people start to talk about things like perceptual similarity, which might be a bit of a stretch in many ways, but we call things intelligent that are you know, close enough. So when you think about the similarity, it's, you wanna say, if two things are similar, that doesn't mean the MSEs are similar, because I can give you an image and an image slightly to the side, and the MSE will be like a billion because that's how the mean squared error works. It's each pixel, subtract it, square it, whatever. And all of the human designed loss functions, any human designed loss function is gonna have some issues somewhere because we designed it, it's not perfect, things are hard to do analytically, whatever. But now we can have a neural network learn our loss function and if that loss function uses CNNs and it uses pooling, then now we've got a loss function that is shift invariant. So suddenly, we can use loss functions that we create as opposed to just our typical loss functions. We can try to construct those loss functions so that they might be perceptual, so that they might be meaningful. So we can actually build some of our, our prior knowledge not just into how we generate things, but into what our loss function is gonna look like. So this is really the heart of why GANs are so fascinating, that you can start thinking about the perceptual difference between two images or two sounds or two texts and not just do the characters line up. Um, so that's really the implication, is that it's meaningful, things can be shift invariant, your loss function is suddenly powerful, you can talk about perception, you can talk about similarity in a meaningful way that's not just L2s, et cetera. So I think that's a couple slides to, to hammer that out, but we do have um, limited time today. It's all 10.30. Okay. So now we're just gonna give a quick overview of things people have done with GANs over the last couple of years. Um, we're not gonna spend too much time on any specific one of them, but just to get a sense of how you can take this core framework, which is I can learn to generate X, and then how, how do we do other variations of that. So one example is conditional GANs, which is if you wanna learn P of X given Y, all you have to do is you have to add a given Y to your generator and to your discriminator. So what they've done with this is things like, instead of just learning to generate digits, you can learn to generate digits conditioned on a label. So you've got a function, you've got a neural network, and you give it noise and a label, and it produces images that look like one. And then you give it a different label and it produces images that look like two, whatever it happens to be. Um, 
here is our kind of conceptual diagram. It looks like our typical GAN. They've just added on the Ys. And the results are basically, yeah, they're a little messy. This is a couple of years back. <laughs> but they've conditioned everything on the digits and the numbers. So you can generate a bunch of different fours, a bunch of different fives, a bunch of different eights, whatever it is. Um, although by today's standards, these are kind of kind of junky looking numbers. <laughs> um, one of the other ones that came out right after the original one is Laplacian GANs. And this was an attempt to try to make things a little sharper. And this is utilizing the conditional GANs we just saw. Um, has, it, has anyone heard of a Laplacian pyramid? Or has anyone done image processing before? Maybe one or two? Um, so Laplacian is basically looking at blurred versions. It's the difference in blurred versions, but we're not going to talk about all the vision stuff today. But basically, you can look at the image at different levels of detail, and you can create a GAN that generates the most blurry image. Then you create a conditional GAN that generates the next most blurry image based on that one. And you create a stack of GANs that create more detailed images from less detailed images. And they can create a very sharp image at the end. And I guess this is probably the slide I should have been pointing to to describe that. But so it's this blurring. And then you generate from the bl most blurred and the smallest to the biggest. So at the end, you end up with some relatively large, by 2015 standards, image of a bird by generating that tiny bird over there. And then based on the tiny bird, generating a larger bird. And then at the end, you generate this. And that's your Laplacian GAN. The actual Laplacians look like this, the uh, kind of etch-a-sketch looking things. But those are the, basically the edges at different levels of detail. And by getting different edges at different levels of detail, adding them all together, you end up with a chain that actually gives you um, here's some of the chain going from right to left of the first thing they generate to the last thing they generate. And they were actually able to get pretty, pretty sharp, pretty large images for what they were doing in 2014, 2015. Um, the next step is kind of the deep convolutional GAN. It came after the lap GAN, a little bit afterwards, and it had even cleaner results. And this is where they included a bunch of kind of engineering type work on it to try to clean things up and, and make the networks more stable. And this is where you start to look at, um, you know, this might look more familiar to you, the more modern architecture than the small ones that are being used. And here they've actually got, um, I mean, if you, if you compare, this is like a couple months before the two slides ago, sorry, a couple months after two slides ago, and you'll just see the, the progress things have made. Um, but this is the Elf Sun data set generating uh, bedrooms, basically. Um, and you'll see these are just all bedrooms it's never seen before. But you can create the images. Uh, here's the vector math, which I briefly mentioned, of um, some of the things people have done with them. Of You can take the smiling woman vector and a not smiling woman and add it to a man and then get a smiling man. These guys do look a little bit on the deformed side. I'll admit that. But this is kind of an analog to the king-queen type of, of, of uh, vector math. So vector math in this GAN space, just basic linear stuff, seems to work OK. You can add a smile. Uh, no, this, is, this is the glasses one I mentioned. Of You can take the vectors of men without glasses, subtract the vectors of a man without glasses, add it to a woman without glasses, and then you get glasses on women. So that's <laughs> all kinds of fascinating. And it, it doesn't seem like things should work out linearly like that. But once they've been reduced down into this manifold in a very simplified space, they do kind of work. And the, the thing at the bottom is showing if you didn't do it in the manifold space, but you just did it pixel-wise, you'd get that. So the pixel interpolation doesn't work. But the interpolation in this space works really well. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at, so if you've got this space here that's your latent space, and you look at like, what does that map to here? You'll see like it maps to these images, but this image isn't on that. Like you can't make it with that GAN. So it's trying to figure out what's the, the space of possible faces, not just all images. So like that junk over there wouldn't even be on the manifold. You couldn't get to it with the GAN because the GAN can't make that junk. Um, another extension is the categorical GAN. Um, this is one. <laughs> um, 
I don't want to go through all of these, but it's uh, an entry-based objective, yada, yada. But um, basically, this is where they were trying to say, so the, the CGAN is, I've got known labels. They're labeled. What do I do with them? CATGAN is the semi-supervised, unsupervised version of that, where you're doing something similar, but you don't actually know the labels. You're just trying to optimize that labels are given. So basically, instead of the generator, I'm sorry, instead of the discriminator just labeling this is an A and this is a B, the, gener the discriminator tries to give everything a class label. And then for the generated fake stuff, it tries to give it no class label, meaning like a flat, you know, very, very low entropy, I'm sorry, very high entropy, just like a nothing distribution. So it's a little bit of a twist on it, and it allows you to do some semi-supervised and uh, unsupervised learning of labels. Um, and a lot of where, where GANs have been used, and we'll see that kind of spotted throughout here, is um, there are a lot of different models that people have popped up of trying to model different types of distributions. But um, people have definitely latched on to the idea that this seems useful for unsupervised learning, because you're generating your images. Why, you know, maybe we can use that in some way. Um, so this is the, uh, the cat GAN. So this is, you're not given the labels. So without given labels, you can actually use cat GAN to do clustering. So if you think about the, the C GAN we did before, it's, you can give it a label and generate some data from that label. Here, you're kind of not knowing labels, but saying, if I was given a label, make sure those labels have high entropy of producing whatever these things are. And you actually are learning this you know, dual circle kind of bullseye problem. And they're comparing it to k-means and other things, which obviously give you junk. So these GANs can be used to do clustering in shapes which a neural network can learn, which is basically unlimited shapes. Um, another, uh, another model I just briefly wanted to mention is DRAW. And it's just to, to kind of give a premise. DRAW was a VAE model. Um, and it was drawing an image using attention and kind of recurrently drawing. And the counterpart to that in the, the GAN, so this is what draw looks like, the, the VAE version of. You can kind of see it making the number three, or like drawing different letters, drawing different numbers. You can see um, on SVHN, it actually like create, you, you tell it, I want you to make uh, images from the SVHN. It actually learns to do them kind of number by number. So that's really fascinating to see uh, the interpretability that you can actually get from this recurrent um, formulation. But the, the counterpart is the GRAN by M et al. 2016. And that's basically the, the GAN of, uh, of DRAW. Um, so they're, they're doing much more complicated images. But they can see the uh, recurrent drawing. Oh, So I want to get through this, this presentation by probably 940. Um, one of the more interesting ones I did mention briefly is InfoGAN. Sorry to actually throw all these at you. If you guys have any questions about any specific model, let me know. Um, but my goal is just to say there's a ton of models people have made, and you can take this kind of core idea and bend it in different ways to generate x of y or y of x or whatever you're trying to do. Um, InfoGAN is what I mentioned in terms of disentangling your representations and trying to make them meaningful. So it basically takes the core GAN objective and it adds in this regularization term, which says that you should be able to reconstruct your latent samples, your latent data from your images, which is basically saying your latent data should be interpretable. You should be able to get back to the latent. Um, and if that's the case, it actually learns um, when you walk through the space, different directions in the space start to have meaning because they, are, they can be reconstructed from the images. So there's a number in the space. And when you change it, it changes the width. There's a number. When you change it, it rotates. There's a number. When you change it, and it changes what the digit is. There's another number. So maybe not all of them work, but a, a larger number of these. Uh, more, more of a, actually, no, that was the GAN, right? Yeah, so when you, when you vary in the GAN, like it does change things, but you can't really tell what it's doing. It doesn't, like, it's not interpretable. Versus in the InfoGAN, when you change things, like they, they mean something. So this is actually learning something about the space. And when you think about this, 
um, at a high level compared to what you've been thinking of before in like your discriminative networks, you see why it's so much more interesting, but so much more of a challenge, which is before you were just thinking, here's an image, is that zero through nine? Please tell me which one it is. Versus now we're saying, here are images, what's the rotation, what's the width, what's the bold? All these other things you're developing an understanding of. So it's a very complicated, detailed understanding that you're getting, whether it's, necessarily, whether it's necessary for the problem you're trying to solve is a different issue. Um, here's another set of examples where they've got vectors that change the elevation. They change how big the guy's head is or what the lighting is, things like that. So everything is now meaningful in here. Uh, some more chairs, I don't need too many results on these, but you can change how big the chair is. And that's, I mean, that, just looking from there to there, it's like, yeah, that's, that's a small chair, that's a big chair, and that one's got some covering. There are other changes too, but you really have a, a meaning into what these vectors are doing. So yeah, it's just a linear interpolation, but suddenly this linear interpolation legitimately looks like something you could describe to people and believe. Kind of cool, right? <laughs> Does that explain your, your interpolation questions earlier? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so another type of model we're gonna briefly mention is adversarial autoencoders, AAEs. They're a little bit between GANs and VAEs. The idea is you still have an autoencoder, with a VAE, you had an autoencoder and you said this latent distribution is gonna be regularized using a lower bound on the KL divergence to match Z, to match my prior. And that's like a complicated way of doing it. With a, with a AAE, what you're saying is, I've got an autoencoder and I'm gonna use a discriminator. And the discriminator is gonna be sure, is going to ensure that your latent distribution matches a Gaussian or matches whatever it is you want it to match. So when you're using an AAE, you're saying your latent distribution is going to exactly match that, that Gaussian. It's not a bound you're optimizing, you're using a GAN to do it. And because you're using a GAN to do it, uh, here's, here's the basic architecture. You can see the, um, at the top you've got an autoencoder and then at the bottom you've got these random samples and that's the discriminator. So it's basically, you've got an autoencoder, and then that Z is being regularized by a GAN. And what that ends up doing is makes things much sharper. And this goes back to how we were comparing earlier between the VAEs and the, the GANs. I don't wanna bash a, uh, VAEs too much. They're actually really useful. But um, let's say you have your latent distribution is like a star point. If you train an adversarial autoencoder to learn a star point, here's the distribution it learns. When you train a VAE to do it, that's what it learns. It gets close, it gets in around the right shape, but it's blurry. It goes outside the lines of the box. The VAE, or the, the AAE stays within the lines. Same, same example above there, which is you say fit a simple Gaussian, and the AAE fits that, that hidden representation into that Gaussian, and it matches that Gaussian. The VAE, I mean, that's, that's Gaussian-ish, but it's not, <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't really compare the, the quality of the results. But that's where a lot of the, the, um, the blurriness comes from, is this is your encoding. So when you train your generator with your GAN, your GAN generator is seeing stuff that's legitimately a Gaussian versus your variational autoencoder decoder, the last part of, of the autoencoder, it's seeing that, which is kind of Gaussian, but it's not as good as you'd want it to be. And as a result, it's not being trained on the perfect data and it gets kind of on the blurry side. Uh, here's the manifold that we've been kind of mentioning around class, but if you, we've seen interpolations in one dimension before, but here's a 2D one. So if you interpolate in 2D, you can kind of see how all the, all the numbers can flatten out into a single space. Um, also, what's nice about GANs is you can make arbitrary priors when you actually do, I don't know if you did that in the VAE representation, but like, if you do like the derivation of like how you actually do the VAE, it's kind of a mess and it's very Gaussian specific because we're trying to do some analytic bound on something that can only be done on distributions we understand. Versus with a GAN, everything's just being sampled and optimized. So your prior could be literally anything you can make. It really doesn't matter. You don't need to have an analytic understanding of these things because you don't have to do some 
analytic KL divergence lower bound, you just say, put it into the network, train it, I'm good. So you can make a spiral, and then that means you're mapping all of your images onto a spiral. You can make a star, and that means you're mapping all your images onto a star. You can do whatever you want to do. And what's actually really intriguing is kind of the star thing, is let's say I want to map all of my digits onto a star with 10 points. It happens to, find, it happens to map them, so basically all the points are on a different, uh, a different point of the star. So it, it does the clustering, basically, for you, depending on how you, uh, you organize your latent space. Yeah? Just to confirm, I understand, this is what the latent space looks like? Yes, this is what they encode it to. So it's the latent space, and it's also the prior, because the, the thing it's encoding to is being regularized to match the prior. So I mean, there's not a picture of the prior, but you can imagine what the prior was. Like The prior would be like a very perfect line, and then this is what it's actually learned. So this is the encoding, it's the latent space, I don't know if there are any, Z, maybe there are a couple other words people use. It's the, uh, the hidden representation, uh, however, however you want to think about it. But it's the, it's the thing that it gets mapped into and then back out of. It's the middle of the autoencoder. The middle part of the autoencoder looks perfectly like what you want it to be. So you can say what you want that Z to look like. Versus if you just train an autoencoder with no regularization, the encoding that it learns could be absolutely anything. You never know what it's going to be. Um, this AE can be used. Um, they're they're semi-supervised versions, as I mentioned briefly. Um, I've got all the, the papers referenced if you guys want to take some This ends at 1020, right? Because I remember there's those slides. Great. Um, and it allows you to disentangle, as we talked about. And here's some results on disentangling the content and style, that they've got different types of digits. And you can say, like, kind of, uh, I don't want to call them font families, but kind of like that. If, if you wanted to make font families with a neural network, it would kind of look along these lines of that's the, the really thin digits, and those are the really bold digits, and whatever it is. And these are all learned from the data set. Uh, one of the more interesting ones, this is an extension, which is called a bigan. And this addresses the problem we talked about earlier of your GAN learns to go from Z to X, not from X to Z. So it's useful, but it doesn't do everything for you. Um, the BIGAN learns both directions. So you have an encoder and a decoder, as in your um, autoencoder would have had. Um, the difference is your discriminator looks at pairs now. It looks at real data and encoded real data versus decoder versus prior samples and decoded prior samples. So it's this really pretty kind of symmetrical thing of like, so you've got random samples and your generator uses those to produce generated data. You've got real data and your encoder uses those to produce encoded, your encoded data. And we want these, these prior samples to be similar to your encodings and we want our generated data to be similar to our x's. And it's that, those pair of things and the relationship between the two of them that you want to be the same. How is that different from a VAE? It's different from a VAE because you're training all of the components that are in a VAE, but the objective you're training them with is a discriminator. So instead of just saying that, if, like, if you replace that d with like mean squared error, then it would be a VAE. But the kind of fascinating thing is it's no longer mean squared error. It's a function. And can that function tell the difference between things being encoded and things being decoded? And then that function could be CNNs and pooling and RNN, whatever you want it to be. And that's where all the flexibility comes in. So this kind of makes up for what you were missing with the GAN. So now you've got an encoder and you've got a decoder. But you're not training the KL divergence. You're not training any of these things. You're, you're gaining it. So you should get a, a much sharper results, completely different, with, while still having the ability to go into a latent space and out of latent space. Um, so the objective written out, the, the, the picture is probably going to be easier for you guys. But here's the, the written version. It looks kind of similar to what you had before. But now you've got kind of two inputs on both sides. And Result-wise, so if you give it a query of coffee, give me things that look like coffee, so you can take the coffee picture and then go into the latent space 
And then based on where you are in the latent space, you can go back out to images that are nearby. So you can use it for, for querying, you can use it for generating, you can use it for finding similarity metrics, whatever you want to do. So one measure of similarity could be just if you convert both things into the latent space, how far are they in this new space, which is now meaningful. And when you do that, you've got pictures of peppers that look like, or uh, carrots that look like bell peppers that look like whatever, bananas. And you've got coffees and different dogs and different things. And uh, but yeah, yeah. So th all types of things. And this is all based off of the 2014 basic GAN paper. Um, so just any quick questions about what you can do with GANs before we start talking about how you actually train them and, and how that works. Oh, no, definitely not. Uh, there's going to be a lot of images. I know you guys mostly speech here, but ton of speech work. Um, it's trickier when you're generating text because it's discrete, but there is work on that. But for things like generating speech, there's actually a lot of good research. Yes? I, think, I remember there's also an interesting work uh, called Cycling Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, style transfer is hot right now. Yeah, so if you guys just search GANs, and like this, this presentation isn't the most updated, but it's like, like if you look at like any conference and just, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll really see a incredible amount of research and, and filtering out the important stuff is, is tricky. But um, yeah, there, there are a lot of directions people have taken them and kind of the, the two directions are, how do you apply them to different networks? What kind of data sets can we do? Plus the optimization questions, but yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of, a lot of speech stuff. There's a lot of attempts to do text. Some of them looks pretty good. Some of them's kind of borderline. It depends on which paper you're looking at. But I mean, yeah, it's the, the theory holds for anything, but people like images because image papers are just really, really nice. It's like if, if you're trying to submit a presentation or you're trying to like give a talk and you've got like beautiful faces and you've got pictures of dogs in them, like, like, uh, yeah, basically, that, I think that's what a lot of it comes to, is if I have a paper where I can have pictures of dogs and cats and the transition between them, I have a better chance of being published than if you have, I can generate sound, but like, I don't know. You can't put that into, you can't print that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also, I think they take like one good image from like a thousand. <laughs> I, I think for the earlier papers, very much the case, the, the current stuff is actually very sharp. The trickier thing is not how many images they took, it's how many times do you think they trained it before they got something that worked. Because what you'll see with especially the old GANs is I can give you a perfectly functioning GAN with all the hyperparameters, and you can add epsilon to any one of them and get absolute junk. Like, in like a small epsilon, like it, they're, they're very unstable for a lot of situations. They take a lot of kind of practice and know-how uh, one of the good things about GANs is it's a lot of good practice for you guys that like, has anyone used TensorBoard before? All of you should learn TensorBoard. How about Visdom? Any Visdom people? No? Okay. That's the key. So when you're starting off with deep, deep learning, you kind of like throw some hyperparameters at it, train it, and then maybe you're good enough. But with GANs, you've really got to understand what's going on, diagnose your network. So, you kind of have to do that with other networks. We don't really have to have to. It depends on how much, you know, how much performance you're going for. But for neural networks that are doing GANs, you really need to, I need to plot my loss here and my gradients, and I need to plot every single thing to understand what's happening, what's going wrong, what might be a little too high, what might be a little too small. But if you don't really have good metrics, good understanding of what's going on, then you can't do anything. So it's, it's, um, it really forces you to be careful about what you're doing, tracking your experiments. Because yeah, you, you, you move this knob a little bit and suddenly it stops working. You've got to be really good at understanding where all the knobs are and what effects those have on what things you can measure and graph. And so yeah, they're a lot of fun. Um, things have been getting a lot cleaner in recent years with um, spectral normalization, Wasserstein GAN, gradient penalty, a bunch of other things I'll throw out there. But um, the original GANs were very unstable. They've gradually gotten more and more stable. They're not perfect yet. But um, basically, that, that, that epsilon that you can move things is slowly getting bigger so that you don't have to be quite as, quite as skilled and or lucky to, to get something to work correctly. So yeah, too good to be true. What's the problem? 
really the problem is that it's tricky to train. Like, I, I think if they weren't hard to train, they would just be the go-to model for just about everything because they're pretty cool. But <laughs> it's, it's just the, the, the training complexity, how long they take to train, getting the hyperparameters correctly, <coughs> getting everything working. Um, so a lot of tricks. Um, and the research has, uh, do I have a table of contents on this one? Maybe I do. Maybe I have one later. Um, actually, that might be on this slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the recap. And here. GANs are different, but the optimization issues. So some of the problems are that, in general, two-player games don't guaranteed converge with gradient descent. There are plenty of examples, not even with GANs, but with just basic game theory where that doesn't work. Um, you're doing simultaneous updates, and you have to balance these two guys to find that stationary point. There is a stationary point. There's no guarantee of reaching it. Um, I don't know if you guys had the, the Fallman lecture this semester. Did they? Yeah, yeah. I, I love Fallman and his, his herding, but that's a good way to look at these. Um, there's a phenomenon called mode collapse in GANs, but it's kind of similar to herding. But it's basically you train your generator on MNIST 0 through 9, and it only generates 1s. Or normally it'll like only generate 1s and 7s. But it will like focus on some subspace, and that's all it'll do. So there, that's a, a very frequent problem. Um, I actually just had a student from last semester message me that she's having this issue with her GAN. Um, so don't be surprised when this happens to you, but that also means don't give up. And sometimes just tweaking something one way or the other, trying a new technique, uh, and most importantly, just getting your metrics and your graphs so you know what's happening. You, you can make comparisons. Um, but yeah, adversarial optimization is harder, more general, nonlinear. The gradient's noisy. Sometimes it's non-informative. Simultaneous updates are very tricky because you can't have one get too far ahead of the other. They need to be balanced, and either one being too far ahead is a problem. So basically, if the discriminator isn't doing its job well, if the discriminator can't tell the difference between real and fake, then doing what the discriminator says is making you worse. You know, if the, if the, guy, if the discriminator is saying that that's the way you should go and he's wrong, then obviously doing that is going to hurt you. So if the discriminator is not trained enough, then it doesn't work. If the discriminator is trained too much, then there's no gradient to work with. Uh, you, one very simple way to look at it is just squashing. So you have a sigmoid function, and you have this uh, logistic loss. And if you train your discriminator forever, eventually he's just 100% 1, 0 gradients, whatever. So then you have the discriminator can tell the difference, but the generator can't do anything with that if the discriminator is too far ahead. So the discriminator has to be in this. It's like uh, if you're giving someone you know, an AP level quiz and they're in kindergarten, like it's not going to work. You need your discriminator to be like a little bit ahead so that it trains it a little bit more. Maybe curriculum learning is, is also kind of a good analogy of just your discriminator needs to be a little bit better than your generator so it can tell the generator which way to go. If it's worse, then it's obviously going to make it worse. And if it's too much better, then the generator can't work with it. It's just way too hard. So finding that balance can be very tricky. What affects the balance? The learning rate of your generator, the learning rate of your discriminator, how many times you train them, how complicated the functions are, whether they have regularization or not. Uh, but yeah, there's so many. When we talk about which one's learning faster than the other, it makes sense. But what is learning faster? It's, it's a factor of how many parameters and all of these other variables. So that's all of these things that you can tune would affect the rate at which one of the other learns. And tuning any of those things, if they affect that rate, could destroy or make it work. So there, there's a very kind of interrelated ecosystem of hyperparameters that you need to understand how they affect uh, both of the players and the balance between the two of them. So there is that theoretically stable point, but we might not reach it due to these practical issues. Um, I do have a couple of videos of, um, of things failing, which is kind of nice, actually, and uh, common failures. Actually, this, this might be fun to watch, just to show you guys kind of what we're talking about. So when I said mode collapse, you train your neural network for a while, 
and you train it and you train it and it's a little choppy. And then at the end, that's what it learns. Right? I've trained it on all of the digits. It learned to produce a lot of versions of the number one. And it's producing a lot of different number ones, but it's only producing the number one. Um, and that's, that's, that's the mode collapse we were talking about. And when you train it, that's, that's what your TensorFlow window will look at, will look like. So as long as you can recognize that, then you can, uh, you'll know what to do and you'll, you'll know when that happens. So, so diagnosing issues are probably uh, one of the most important things. Uh, that was the mode collapse. Um, I have a video of cycles. Um, it this thing goes off to a different side. But here's another just chaos of things happening. This is a deep convolutional GAN. This is, this is what a GAN looks like if your hyperparameters aren't good. That. <laughs> so this is really kind of describing the difference between the VAEs and the GANs. Is if your VAE has like bad parameters, it'll be a little blurry. But like a GAN with, with bad parameters will do this. It's a complete chaotic cycle of trippy images. And this is as it's training. This is not the interpolation. This is the images it's producing as it trains. It never settles down into anything. It just, yeah. <laughs> so there, there, there are plenty of weird examples of GANs. And those are all things that would have worked with slightly different hyperparameters or did work with other different hyperparameters, just get, getting things exact. So they're tricky. I think I've, I've made that point clear. But now we see this, which is just a, a subset of the, the last few years of just different ways people have thrown out there of how do we make these more stable? How do we make them cleaner? And um, you know, we're just going to spend a few minutes on maybe some of the more important ones and just mention some of the other guys. But there has been an absolute ton of work, uh, one direction being how do we use them, one direction being how do we make them actually work correctly. Uh, unrolled is very intriguing. Unroll generative adversarial networks basically look into the future. Kind of think of it as like playing chess, which is I don't want to make the best move that makes, you know, makes the most points on this turn. I don't want to make the capture for this move. I want to make the best thing for 10 moves down the line. So you can actually unroll recurrently what the generator and the, you can unroll how the game is going to play out and then optimize for how the game is going to be in 10 moves, not just the next move. And optimizing for several moves ahead actually does a great job. Problem with this one is it's just very long to train because if you're training 50 moves ahead, that means you're like running 50 steps of gradient descent for a single step of gradient descent, <laughs> which is kind of a mess. <laughs> but it's, it's very intriguing that it, it even works. This is one of the earlier ones. Um, yeah, so think of it like chess. You want to make the move, not the best next move, but the best move for the move after. And this is the type of, so, so you want to get familiar with this type of diagram, because you'll see this in, in almost all GAN literature, or something along these lines of like, this is our network, and when you, it, the generator starts with the dot, and then the dot moves around, and eventually it matches what our target is, versus when you just have, the regular GAN, you get the mode collapse, which is basically, it just ends up with a dot which matches one of the dots in our target. So this is like the very simplified version of the mode collapse we saw earlier. And they show that they, they can avoid mode collapse using this enrolling. And uh, yeah, this is the types of failures people see in GANs all the time. Uh, like I said, things, things have gotten better definitely, but do not be surprised if you train a GAN for 100,000 steps and you end up seeing like a, the letter G, as far as I can tell. So, I mean, but that, that is the type of, of thing that can happen. And so enrolling uh, does take one step for cleaning it up. Uh, the next big step, though, was improved. And by the way, I am doing these somewhat chronologically. Um, and I'll just skip over some in between. But, um, this was more of an engineering kind of paper in the sense of here are a lot of techniques which we find in combination clean things up. We can do some averaging, we can do some feature matching, we can do some smoothing, and they'll, they'll go through a lot of their different actual techniques. Batch normalization is actually pretty important. But um, people are realizing that these GANs are really complicated, everything affects them, and even just like adding L2 regularization makes them converge faster. 
Adding batch normalization makes them converge faster. So all these things that you're used to in, you know, in your discriminative networks, you're like, oh, I add batch normalization and maybe I'll get like 0.1% increase, whatever. In GANs, you're like, oh, I had batch normalization and it actually works as opposed to not working sometimes. So the, the, the effect size is much larger of these tiny tweaks and tiny optimizations. Um, mini batch discrimination, I'm not going to, or yeah, maybe I'll spend a little bit of time. Uh, mini batch is an interesting idea, which is instead of the discriminator looking at one point, it can look at a family of points. And this is meant to specifically address the mode collapse issue which is my data really does have the number one in it. So if you produce the number one, I don't know whether you're the generator or the discriminator. You could be either. You both should be producing the number one. If you produce 10 number ones, then it's like, no, you're the generator. You're an idiot. Stop doing that. So looking at multiple samples at the same time can help you tell the difference between the real distribution and the fake distribution. because. <coughs> One fake one and one real one look about the same. But if you're looking at 10 things from the distribution, you're not going to get 10 ones from the real distribution, but you're going to get 10 ones from the fake distribution. Uh, so Minibatch does a good job at stopping the, uh, the mode collapse issue. Um, his, another one of the issues was oscillations. You saw in one of the videos that it just, it just kept going. It never settled down. It never did anything meaningful. It kept going in circles. So maybe doing some sort of regularization towards a midpoint is going to stop those cycles. Label smoothing, um, I don't know if you guys mentioned that in other networks, but just a good idea in general for a lot of different types of training. Um, you guys should try that in your homeworks or something. Um, but yeah, so label smoothing is also handy at making the neural network not so sharp. It doesn't overtrain. We were talking earlier about overtraining and about it getting squashed to zero. So then maybe if you smooth things, then maybe it won't overtrain, and then maybe it'll actually work when you're done. Um, so that's another technique they, they put out there. Batch normalization, not too much of a surprise. Um, so that, that was, that was the, uh, the collection from improved techniques. Uh, the next set of steps was least squares GAN was kind of an interesting idea of trying to minimize the L squared, sorry, the L2 distance instead of the cross entropy. And this is going to be very close to the Wasserstein GAN we'll look at next. So in itself, it didn't make too much of a splash, but it's actually, it's actually in the right direction. It just wasn't quite what people were looking for. Um, but you can see how different, like an L2 might be a little smoother, might have a little better properties than cross entropy, which gets squashed really easily. OK. Um, another one, yeah, amortized map inference, adding noise. It's just a fun little technique, but it's adding smoothing, basically. So if you smooth things, then maybe you'll get better results. And that, that, is, a, <laughs> that is a trend in, in many types of networks, not just GANs. Um, another one is the energy-based GAN, which is a little closer towards getting to the Wasserstein GAN, which is the current state of the art. Um, but it was basically saying, let's take away all these nonlinearities and just kind of make a, make a simple function. But now we finally get to the Wasserstein GAN. And this is what's made um, a relatively large step, although this paper specifically doesn't work at all. Um, <laughs> It's actually a joke, but, but they, they finally hit on a really good idea. Um, and then for some of you more math and stat oriented people, this might resonate a little more. Um, but basically, what is this GAN? What is it doing? What's going on here? But you can start thinking about a GAN as solving a dual problem. Um, so has anyone worked with duals before? They're like the ground union something somethings, anyone? Um, so basically, it's the idea of you can split this problem into an inverted problem. Um, I don't know if I can describe duels in like 10 minutes. <laughs> but um, you guys should look into it. It's very intriguing. Um, how, I can, how I can boil it down. Um,
yeah, you, you end up with, with uh, two problems, and one problem is trying to like optimize the constraint. So you, the, the duels basically relate into something where you had a constraint, and now that constraint becomes an optimization problem. Um, I guess that's the, the quickest way to describe it. Um, anyways, so now your loss is linear. Everything's very simple. You've basically like taken a bunch of junk out of the old GAN equation. You're saying like, I'm just going to use like linear losses here, some expectations, and what you end up with is this at the bottom. So that's the new GAN function, which is much simpler than the earlier one, which had a bunch of logs and one minuses and um, was based off the cross entropy loss. But what makes this one tricky and the part where people are kind of stuck on right now is this little, this little notation here, which is the Lipschitz has to be less than or equal to one. So what they basically said is there's an earth mover distance. The earth mover distance is a great way of comparing two distributions because it's got all these properties that KL does not have. It's smooth. It looks good. Um, so I guess first we'll, we'll do a little slide on what is the earth mover distance. Earth mover distance is how much you have to move. So if you think about your distribution as like piles of sand, it's how much sand times how far do you have to move it. So if you've got a Gaussian here, and you've got a Gaussian one step over here, then the, everything here gets moved over one. That's a distance of one. If you've got a Gaussian here, and it's two over there, then the earth mover distance would be two, whatever it is. But it's, it's moving the distribution in the smallest way possible. Um, so it's the infimum over pi. Pi is your plan for how to move things from one to the other. So you're trying to map two distributions in a way that moves them very efficiently. Um, yes, any questions about what the earth mover distance is? It's kind of a, an important point to make. Maybe I should even draw it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, th th think of it literally as, as, as it says, as moving earth, that how far this pile has to go over. And it's, it doesn't go to, to infinity in the same way that KL does. So the, the distance between two Dirichlets, for example, if you're using KL, is infinite if they're not the same and zero if they're the same. That's what the KL di divergence looks like, which is things match zero, they don't match infinity. <laughs> Jensen Shannon is log two if they don't match, zero if they match. So the, these are not very helpful. But the Wasserstein distance is, is just how far apart they are. So if you have two Gaussians, or two, the reason I is like just two, two Dirac de deltas that are like moving towards each other. Like the Wasserstein distance is how far apart they are, and then it goes down as they get closer. So it's a distance you can use to make the two things closer. All these other metrics don't help you do that at all. So that's why JS and KL and these other things are just not helpful for GANs. Like when you're using earth mover distance, this is what your losses look like, and you try to minimize it, and it's like, oh, go down, and then you'll, you'll find your, your minimum. Right? You can go down that path very easily. If that's what your loss function looks like, it's just completely flat except for one point where it's at zero, like how do you, how, how do you gradient descent that? that is given, granted, that is worst case, but it, that is the type of thing that happens. Things get squashed. You've got zero gradient. But the earth mover always gives you a meaningful gradient because it's which way to go. Sounds logical. That's for Dirichlet? Yeah, this was for, it was for, or this was for two delta functions, right? Two Dirac, I think. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, this is a, uh, yeah, I think this is just Dirac. Little, little delta functions as they move across. Because like two delta is like, it's, it's either you're one and then it's log zero or the other guy's log zero. So like, you, you end up with a lot of log zeros in, in that way, versus here, it's just the distance. Um, so maybe this is, this is probably a good way of looking at it. Of If you tried to optimize, so let's say you've got a Gaussian there and a Gaussian there, right? If you train a GAN, it will saturate, which means it's going to be ones, and then a vertical line, and then zeros. So that's that red line. And that's the GAN discriminator function people have been working with. But if you were to train the Wasserstein GAN, 
meaning you're setting the Lipschitz and you know, the function we had before, that's your gradient. And that's a gradient you can work with, because anywhere you are on that gradient, it tells you which way to go. So the real point of this paper is that blue line is a helpful gradient. It tells you what to do. The red line gets saturated and eventually becomes useless. Um, so the way, the way we connect the, uh, the Wasserstein GAN and why are they even calling it the Wasserstein GAN is that solving the earth mover distance, the dual of that is optimizing over the space of functions with the Lipschitz of one. So then the question is how do you limit the Lipschitz to one? And um, you're seeing that this is starting to bring, uh, the original GAN papers were almost, I don't want to say like unmathematical, but like untheoretical maybe is the word, but very, uh, something that works but might not necessarily be founded in why it works. Versus now that people are starting to understand, oh, the earth mover distance is important, we can solve for the dual of that, and, the, and that's what the discriminator does, we've now got kind of a theoretical backing which was brought in after the fact. It's an interesting way that, that things have played out. Um, but the Washington GAN is what really started to make that connection. Um, they claim that it's more stable, that it's meaningful, that it works, that it doesn't need tooting, but it just doesn't actually work at all. It gets squashed. It's like the original Wasserstein GAN is absolutely terrible. And like if you read the paper, they're like, we've tried it on many networks. It's never failed us once. And it like, it's a little annoying, like the grandiose statements it makes. But the, the problem is the way they do this. So the way they actually make this Lipschitz constant is they just clip all the parameters to a constant value. So it's like just everything in our neural network cannot be larger than 0.1 or smaller than point, you know, negative 0.1, whatever it is. But they're just clipped. So all they're doing is clipping them, which does technically limit the Lipschitz, but it also just makes things not very flexible and learn a whole lot. So Washington GAN gradient penalty is, um, I think Washington GAN, yeah, I think Washington GAN GP was actually like put on archive while Washington GAN was still in review or something like that. <laughs> these are, these really did come out one after the other, because yeah, those were both the same year. Um, but Washington GAN GP is doing the same thing, but it's saying, okay, this Lipschitz constraint, is there a better way for us to do that? And the way it does that is it samples. So it's basically just sample at points, check what the Lipschitz is, and by that I mean check what the gradient is, and then just regularize that. So pretty straightforward, which is you've got your generator, discriminator, you've got all your regular GAN stuff, and then you add in this penalty, which is the gradient of the discriminator minus one squared. So it should be about one, because we said the Lipschitz should be about one, so we take the norm of the gradient and say that should be about one. Pretty straightforward. The only real problem is that that requires some sampling and that actually doing that term over there does require a second gradient, but it's, it's with respect to the x and the parameters, so it's not, it's not super huge, but it's pretty big. Um, so yeah, Washington GAN GP, you train everything just like the Washington GAN, you got a very similar similar to everything really, just that extra um, regularization term. So now the question is, where do you want to make these, these decisions, right? So you've got to regularize the gradient. Where do you sample the gradient to regularize? And the, the smart idea they had is just, let's just do random interpolations between generated and real, which makes sense, which is I've got my real data over here, I've got my generated data over here, my function should be smooth. Where should it be smooth? between here and there. Makes sense. So you just randomly go in between the gener generated and the real, and in that area, you sample the gradients, and then you say the gradients should be one. And that's how you implement a Washington GAN. Um, so this is really what the gradient clipping did. So the top row is the Wasserstein GAN, and you see what the clipping does, which is the clipping prefers straight lines which is not helpful. So like it tries to do the best it can using only like weird straight lines and they're just not looking good. 
So they've got eight gaps. <laughs> I mean, yeah, basically look, look at the picture. It makes boxes and the real data is this. That looks, that looks perfect. That is, you've got these eight Gaussians and then it's got like, uh, like a topographic markings on it. That looks exactly like it should using the improved Wasserstein GAN. The, the regular GAN just, or the, the regular WGAN without the, uh, the gradient penalty makes everything straight lines. Well, regular, like yeah, so the straight up GAN would do anything depending on what the learning rate is here, what the learning rate is there. The advantage of the Wasserstein GAN is it can't overtrain because it's clipped. So it's clipped, it's, you can train it a billion iterations, it'll get to the same point, it'll still be useful, but it'll be straight lines versus, <laughs> versus the Wasserstein GAN. So yeah, they, it would basically look like dots at each of the Gaussians and then nothing anywhere else. So that would be a very uninformative distribution. Whereas that's what these are trying to show is, on one hand, this, these do show you gradients and curvatures that show you where the Gaussians are, but they're not too sharp. It's not like it just peaks at each of those Gaussians and nothing anywhere else. You can see that these are like a very smooth lines radiating in and out and towards each of these points. And that, that's really what they're trying to show. So you can't overtrain. I think these were, yeah. Yeah, so these are, the generator is held fixed, and then they train the discriminator to completion to make these examples. So this is, no matter how many times you train the discriminator, this is the best discriminator it can make, and it won't go past this. So that really looks perfect. That shows you what you want to do. Um, and then a little bit behind the scenes, what they do. Yeah, yeah, so this is what we're talking about too which is when you do the gradient clipping in the Wasserstein GAN, and then you look at a histogram of the weights, they look like that. Like all the weights are either the negative limit or the positive limit. Not super helpful. It, that's, that's the effect of clipping, and that's not that surprising, honestly. Versus when you use the Wasserstein GAN GP, your weights are held within a range, but like they look like weights should look. That looks like a normal distribution. That's kind of what you expect the weights of your network to look like. So that's actually a good idea of something to do is whenever you guys are running your code, do a little for loop, throw your, your weights into a histogram, and then take a look at them, and that'll tell you if your network's doing something funny. Uh, just in general, good idea to do. Um, so yeah, we get much better results with the GP. Um, uh, but the problems are that it requires a second gradient, and it requires, I mean, a uh, second degree gradient, and it requires sampling, so it might not be analytically, you know, the best. Um, so another update, this is a little bit later, which is called Gradient Descent GAN is Locally Stable, which is a bit of a, a mess of a title, but it's showing that um, it, it's, it's close to the numerics of GANs, which is not quite what we do. The numerics of GANs is very intriguing. But this is a consensus optimization, and I'll spend a few minutes before class ends on this guy, which is we've been talking about these adversaries and two people working against each other. But um, to end on a nice note and try to bring this all back, the numerics of GANs brings, is talking about consensus optimization, which is, hey, maybe these two guys can get along. Like, I know you've got one goal and you've got another goal. But can we find anything that you guys can agree on and try to like de-escalate and, and get to a good point? So basically, the numerics of GANs and consensus that they start talking about is that you've got a regularizer that both people have to work with. There's an extra loss, and both the generator and the discriminator have this loss. And that loss is how hard they're fighting and trying to make them fight a little bit less and reduce the gradients and make them get along. And it's basically just the the norm of the gradients squared. And this extra regularization means that that point that we talked about, the stable point you're not guaranteed to get, is now actually having gradients pointing towards it. So it's not just an equilibrium point, it's, it's locally stable. With small deviations around it, you will return back to that point, which was not the case before. In the case before, you had a stable point but if you pushed it to any side, think of it like a, if I stood a pencil, like there is a stable point where I can stand a pencil, but if I pushed, like if I go to the left, 
it'll keep going to the left. If I go to the right, it'll keep going to the right. It's not, it, it's a stable point. It, it, it is at equilibrium, but it's not going to hold it there. Versus with the scan, you're trying to make something that's actually going to hold it to, uh, to get into that stable consensus region. As to how they do that, there's a vector field. They try to identify the vector field and add a regularization term, which is just the square here, the, the square of that vector field to try to find a minimum. And the results they find, this is another, kind of similar to the results you saw before of when you train a GAN, you end up with God knows what that's supposed to look like. When you train the consensus GAN, it looks like what you want it to look like. Um, so I think that's our time here. I've actually got a class in this room in 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll be around if you guys have questions. Um, and I'll, I'll mention this one just because that's from CMU. And it had a great name. I wanted to put Sin. <laughs> yeah. Thank Good seeing you guys. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah, Dragon was, uh, let me check out who that was. Dragon. It's like, no, I actually meant Dragon. <laughs> uh, Dragon was, I don't remember who that was. I don't know who that was.